Hebrews 10, verse 14, says, For by one sacrifice Jesus has perfected forever those that are being sanctified. The one sacrifice speaks of the sacrifice of Christ that he made of himself at the cross. That verse means God has provided every need for time and eternity in every area of life for every believer. There's nothing more Christ has to do. He's done it all in one complete, all-sufficient sacrifice. So what Jesus has done on the cross is complete, but our appropriation of it is progressive. So God has a wonderful storehouse. Everything I need spiritually, physically, and materially is in that storehouse. But the keeper of the storehouse is the Holy Spirit. In this new covenant, he's the administrator, the executor of the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. If you have a will, there is an executor who makes sure your inheritance is distributed according to your will, the executor. So the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is the one who is our criminal defense attorney. When the enemy who's the accuser comes to accuse, it is the Holy Spirit who defends us. I don't know, we're guilty, but we've been made righteous by Jesus, so he defends us. And, that's a be- and so Derek Prince used to say all the time, make friends with the Holy Spirit. You can talk to him. He's God. It's not like, well, I don't want, I don't want the Lord to feel underrated. Wait a minute. In every part of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're all God. So you don't hurt the feeling of another one. And the Holy Spirit has been sent in the new covenant to to reside within you, upon you, and to administer to you everything Jesus died to give you on the cross. Make friends with him. He's the keeper of the storehouse, and he has one key that opens that storehouse, and its shape is the cross. So only when the Holy Spirit uses the cross to enter do the treasures of God become available to you and me. The basis of every benefit we receive from God is what was done on the cross by Jesus Christ. So on the cross, a divine exchange took place. All the evil due by justice to the human race, which was guilty, was placed upon Jesus. That all the good due the sinless obedience of Jesus might be made available to us who believe. That was the grace of God. We couldn't demand that he would do it. We didn't know he would do it. But out of his sovereign grace, he arranged this exchange. Through his prophets, he predicted it hundreds of years before it actually took place. Isaiah 53 is the central key to the atonement. And in verse 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. So what is the universal guilt of the human race? Because we haven't all killed anybody, robbed a bank, committed adultery, been drunk. One thing every person has done, we have turned everyone to his own way. It's called rebellion. And there's subtle rebellion, there's mild rebellion, and there's full-blown rebellion, but it's rebellion. It's like a little lie, a big lie. It's a lie. So rebellion, if you have children, you'll see it in multiple forms. All right? Parents, it's okay to talk in church. Of course you would. Sure. So what is the universal guilt of the human race? Rebellion. We've all gone our own way and done our own thing. So rebellion is the universal guilt of the human race. And the mercy of God is that no matter what race or nation I'm from, when Jesus died on the cross, the Lord visited upon him the guilt and rebellion, the iniquity of us all. And that word iniquity means not only the guilt or rebellion, but all of the evil consequences because of my guilt and rebellion. So God visited on Jesus, on the cross, the guilt and rebellion of the human race and all of its evil consequences so that we might receive the benefits of the righteousness of Christ. So I want to give you eight exchanges that occurred at the cross. Exchange number one. Jesus was punished for our iniquity that we might be forgiven. Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5. Some of you need to stop punishing yourself. And you need to forgive yourself because God has, if you have followed Jesus, if you believe on him, he's already forgiven you. In fact, he has no record of your wrongdoing. When I was years ago in London, we were at a Rolls-Royce dealership. One of my friends loves the car and smell it. And also I went with him in. 
But I did a little history, and they, they always prided themselves on making a perfect car. And so in those days, no matter whatever happened to your car or what they had to do to repair it if it broke down, they never had a record in the company of that breakdown. They never showed one. It's as though it never happened. It was a perfect car. It never had a breakdown because they wouldn't make a record of it to keep that image up. And it's kind of neat that in heaven, God has no record of a believer's sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Now, if you go east, you can never get west. And he says, that's how far I've taken your sin from you. And I put it in the deepest part of the sea, never to be remembered anymore. Why can't you let it go? Why? Let it go, let it go. <laughs> if I hear frozen one more time, I am going to freeze. And I actually, I actually love the song, and I'll sing along with it when I hear it, you know. The cold doesn't bother me anyway. Anyway, that's a great song. <laughs> Making Disney a fortune anyway. And it made me forget exactly what I was talking about. But God's, God has no record of it. So why beat yourself up? Why Let it go. Forget it. God doesn't. If you said, well, I, you brought it up, and say, I show no record of it. It was erased by the blood of Jesus. I don't see it. It's not there. That's incredibly good news because that way the enemy can't keep beating you up, beating you up, beating you up, and condemning. His weapon is condemnation, guilt, and shame. God's is there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ. So he says in Isaiah 53, verse 4 and 5, Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was placed upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So being forgiven, we have peace with God. As long as we're unforgiven, we have no peace with God. We are alienated and enemies of God according to Scripture. The Bible says there is no peace to the wicked. So this is the spiritual aspect of healing. Now, when I came up in church, we, we were very, uh, very fundamental. And as a result, we said there is no physical healing in the atonement, only spiritual. You're forgiven. That's spiritually healed. Well, you are spiritually healed. We just read that. My sins are forgiven. But look at the second aspect and the second exchange at the cross. Jesus was wounded that we might be healed. Now, I'm quoting from Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. And when the evening came, many who were demonized brought those who were demonized to Jesus. And he drove out the demons with a word, and he healed all that were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmity and bore our diseases. Now, this apostle in the New Testament is quoting from Isaiah 53 that we just read and saying not only was there spiritual healing, there's physical healing and deliverance in that atonement as well because Jesus is healing the sick, and Matthew is saying that it might be fulfilled, spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. And that was always one my fundamentalist friends would run away from. You shouldn't. This is part of the exchange at the cross. He took up our pain, bore our suffering. We considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. He was stricken or pierced, that's at the cross, for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his stripes we are healed. Now here's an apostle named Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, who his own self bore our sins and his own body on the cross, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. And the Greek word for healing is a standard Greek word for physical healing that comes from the same word as doctor, and it still has the same meaning in modern Greek language today. Third exchange at the cross, Jesus was made sin with our sinfulness that we might be made righteous with his righteousness. Again, Isaiah 53, 10, yet it pleased the Lord to crush him, Jesus, he hath put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Notice that verse, when you shall make his soul, speaking of Jesus, an offering for sin. Jesus' soul was made a sin offering for the whole of humanity. And the same word translated sin offering or guilt offering is translated guilt in the Old Testament. Now the reason this is done is according to the Levitical law, that when a person sinned, he had to bring his sacrificial offering to the priest. 
He had to confess his sin to the priest. The priest laid his hands on the sin offering, this animal, and symbolically transferred the sin of the man to the animal. And then the priest killed the animal and shed its blood and not the man. So the animal paid the penalty for the man's sin because the animal became identified with the sin of the man. And they had to do this every single day. Now, we only have one sacrifice forever for sin in the new covenant through the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10 said it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats could ever take away sin. God just used it as a prophetic picture of the coming of Jesus, the Lamb of God. So every day, man, you had to butcher animals for your sin. We don't have that problem today in the New Testament through Jesus. And so the animal died, the man lived. So the New Testament makes it clear that what the blood of bulls and goats could never do, Jesus' sinless blood did. He became a sin offering, and becoming a sin offering, he became sin. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, here's the Apostle Paul. God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Can you see the exchange? God says, here I am, I'll, you use a coat as an exchange to symbolize it, but my sinfulness, my unrighteousness, I take off and I give to Jesus, and Jesus takes off his sinless righteousness, symbolized as a coat that I probably will never get back on here, and he puts it on me. Now, when the Father sees me, he sees me as his son, righteous. That's all he can see, perfectly righteous. I didn't do it. He did it for me. Jesus didn't sin, but he took my sin and became sin for me so I don't have to die because the wages of sin is death. I kind of had a feeling, you know, like maybe the Lord was saying, it's not a good idea to try to take that off with wires and a microphone and everything. You were right, Lord, I was wrong. But anyway, I think you get the picture. It's an exchange. His righteousness, my unrighteousness. Now he's got to die, and I don't have to die. I will never be punished for my sins, not once ever in my whole life. Some of you still think God's keeping score. He is not keeping score. He already judged you in Christ. You were killed. You were buried and risen with Christ. Because when you accept Jesus, he reckons, that's an accounting term, that you were there, so you were already punished. You were already judged, and you can't be judged for the same crime twice. He judged the whole sin of the world. We have this angry God mentality, but God poured his wrath on Christ for all nations and all humanity on that cross. That's why this is the best news in the world. I'm not guilty of anything anymore. Oh, if you ask my wife, she could probably give you a few pages. But if you ask God, he has no record. It's as white as that piece of paper. There is nothing there. It has been cleansed. It has been forgotten. It can never be remembered anymore. And some of you walk around guilty, head down. You still beat yourself up over what you did uh, in the past. And I'm telling you, you need to do what Frozen did. You need to let it go. Let it go. Yeah, that's beautiful. So when Jesus' soul became an offering for sin, his soul became sin with the sinfulness of humanity. I'm so glad I don't ever have to worry about being judged by God. I hear that word thrown around, God's going to judge you for that. No, I've already been judged in Jesus. I can be chastised, but not judged. Judgment is eternal separation from God. That will never happen to a believer, ever, the rest of your life. Okay? Exchange number four. And by the way, well, I'll get there in a second. Number four. Jesus tasted death that we might share his life. In John 10, verse 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come that you might have life. What was the number one fear of man? Dying, death. It's the enemy. It's called the enemy. And Jesus took death on himself and came back from the dead and to say, now I have the keys of death, hell, and the grave. I'm the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me shall never die, but shall live. He came back from the dead to say, I told you, you don't have to be afraid of death. You can kill the body, but you can't kill the soul. He says, don't be afraid of a man who can kill your body. Be afraid of the man who can kill your soul and your spirit. And that's God Almighty. 
The devil can kill your body. He can have a terrorist cut your head off, but he cannot touch my soul and my spirit. I have eternal life residing in me. And even though my body dies, I live. I live on eternally. So God says, I'm going to take away the fear of death so you don't have to be afraid of it anymore. Touch my body, feel me. This is me. Smell me. He, he stayed around 40, 40 days with 500 different disciples and people asking questions, teaching them to take away. Even one of his apostles said, Thomas said, I won't believe unless I can see the scars and touch his side and see the, his hands. And Jesus said, Thomas, touch me. Check me out. And don't be in unbelief anymore. That's why we get the term doubting Thomas, because Thomas believed because he saw and touched. And Jesus said, how much more blessed are those who have never seen, but believe me. So I've got a better blessing than Thomas did. I never, I've never seen Jesus in the flesh. So here's a big one. Exchange number five. Jesus was made a curse that you and I might receive a blessing. Galatians 3, verse 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. He redeemed us so that the blessings of Abraham may come on us through Christ Jesus. What an exchange. We did a teaching on the blessings of Abraham uh, a year ago or so. It is in the uh, bookshop. And there were three main components of the blessings of Abraham. And we went all the way back to Genesis to give them Scripture just so you could prove it. One was the blessing of elevation. God will lift you. Number two, the blessing of possession, ownership. God said of Abraham, possessor in heaven and on earth. As, far, as much land as you can see, I'll give it to you. Ownership, possession. God wants you to own. And third, dominion. You will have adversaries. You will have to fight, but you win. I'll give you victory over your adversaries. Those are the blessings of Abraham, but also every benefit from every curse, Jesus took every curse on himself, became a curse, so you and I could inherit a blessing. Let me give you seven indicators you might be under a curse. Number one, mental and emotional breakdown. Number two, repeated or chronic sicknesses, especially that run in your family line. Three, Repeated miscarriages and related female disorder. Not a miscarriage, repeated. Four, breakdown of marriage and family alienation. A history in your family of breaking up, of divorce. It runs in families. My family had five divorces. And I remember standing to break that curse so that would never happen to my children. Number five, financial insufficiency. If it, this, again, I have to talk to, to Christians. It doesn't mean you'll have a time when you didn't have a little, you had a hard time financially. Everybody can have a bad month or a bad year. But the, I'm talking about persistent. It's, it's actually just you're always broke. You never have enough. Even though your income is sufficient, you never get out from under debt. It's persistent. You're always the tail and never the head. You won't find Scripture to support that anywhere in the blessing of Jesus. It's a curse. Six, accident prone. Even insurance companies believe the Bible. They will rate you and charge you a higher premium because you are accident. Well, I've had three wrecks in three months. Well, you got a curse going here. Well, Billy has broken six bones. This year he broke three different bones. Well, let's take some authority and break that curse. Well, now, if Billy broke his arm because he's playing football, that's not a curse. He got hit by somebody hard. But we're talking about this repeated accident frequency of accident, accident prone. And number seven, in your family a history of suicide or unnatural death. Even the, the Kennedy curse is mentioned by secular liberal media because of the unnatural deaths and, and young lives that are taken in the Kennedy family. It is a curse. It runs through the line. You can break that curse. Jesus redeemed you from every one of these curses that you might inherit the blessing. When I come back at the end here, we're going to break some curses that you can identify in your family line, okay? Because God says it's illegitimate. Well, Rick, if it's illegitimate, then why should I have to break it? Listen, God says, here's who I've made you. Here's what I've given you. Put on the whole armor of God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. That means you do have to fight. Uh, a thief has no legal authority to come in and steal my goods in my house. 
but he will because he's a thief unless he's resisted by authority. So God says, the thief has no right to do this to you, but if you just passively sit there and let him, he will. He still kill and destroy. But I've given you authority of my name, and I've taken the curse from you. Now you rebuke the enemy, and he will flee from you. So you have to resist this thing. That means you have to fight. Christians come into church is not fighting, unless it's with you and your wife because she's late and you want to get there. And you... I've had a few of those. Could I get an amen from any of the other brothers in here? Yeah, thank you. Well, that's not the fight he's talking about here. Now, most curses concern not only individuals, but families and races. They go from generation to generation, unless something happens to cut them off. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Number six, Jesus endured our poverty that we might share his abundance. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. Now, when was Jesus poor? When was he made poor? On the cross. He was not poor in life. At his birth, he received gold. How would you like to? I'd like to get a Christmas present. Somebody wants to send me some gold. He had a good, a, a good uh, kickoff and start because his parents were living in Egypt. Uh, they were aliens and strangers. I don't know if they had a visa, a green card, or a work permit. I don't know. But they had to have funds to live on, and he's capitalized with gold at the start. He does have a home. He has a mom and a dad, a stepfather. He has a, a robe that is so beautiful that the Roman soldiers at the crucifixion gambled to get it. They wouldn't tear it like they normally did stuff to take from a criminal. They gambled because it was priceless. He had a treasurer. They had support that came in from wealthy women in Herod's court that were married to wealthy men that served in the palace, and they're mentioned in the book of Luke. Susanna is one of them, and they regularly supported his ministry. Judas was the treasurer. He was stealing money. None of the rest of the disciples even noticed it. If I lost 50 bucks, I'd know it, and they don't know it. Jesus had to supply them with food and lodging. I think a lot of my dear Catholic friends think Jesus just laid on the street, covered up in cardboard with 12 people. Where did you get that? He's got a, he's got, he's funded. He's got to pay for these guys. Can you imagine 12 men? These boys can eat and they have to have lodging to sleep. And he took care of that. So get over this idea of poverty meant no money. He paid taxes. I wish I could do what he did, go down and fish, catch a fish, Johnny, and take that gold coin and pay the IRS for us. So the poverty that he endured was becoming sin for us on the cross that we might share in his abundance. And then it says in 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, and God is able to make all grace abound towards us that we always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. See if you can find any area not covered by that promise. Let me read it again. And God is able to make all grace abound towards us, that we always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Now, that's the level of God's provision for His people made possible by the sacrifice of Jesus at the cross. If Jesus said in Acts, it is more blessed to give than to receive, it is the will of God you have all of your needs met and some left over to give. So Jesus was not poor. Uh, I suppose this is the trap of the enemy. If he can't destroy a truth, then corrupt a truth. So he's taken people in the ministry that were charlatans who deceived and defrauded people who spent extravagant sums of money in corruption, tricked people with false claims, claiming God said, you'll get your house paid off if you give $1,000 or something. And as a result, many in the church turned against anything called prosperity. They even call it a prosperity gospel. There's no such thing in Scripture. But if you read the Bible, God talks about bringing your tithe, rebuking the devourer, breaking that curse, giving you abundance, and the New Testament is filled with it, the blessing of God. The liberal soul shall be made fat. Now, it doesn't mean you'll have a Bentley and live in Terrell Hills in a $4.5 million house. Some, might, some will, but everybody won't. But everybody has a right to have abundance. That's simply more than enough, not barely enough. How can I give if I'm broke? 
How can I help the poor if I'm poor myself? I want to be a blessing to others. God told Abraham, I'm going to bless you, and you will be a blessing to the nations. Everything God does for you that's good is so you can enrich the lives of other people, so you can expand the kingdom. And you can't do that broker than the Ten Commandments. So if you've allowed yourself, well, I guess this is just the way it is, you need to renew your mind with Scripture here. And listen to this one. This will really make you happy. Deuteronomy 28, verse 47 and 48. God says, because you did not serve me joyfully and gladly in the time of your prosperity. One of the dangers of success and prosperity is we tend to forget God. We get busy. We drop out of church. We lose our connections, and suddenly we just end up corrupting ourselves. So God cautions, not against prosperity, but that in it, it's easy to forget God who made all that possible. And over and over, he warns Israel about it. And he says, because you didn't serve the Lord your God joyfully and gladly in time of prosperity, therefore, in hunger and thirst... In nakedness and dire poverty, you will serve the enemies that the Lord will send against you. He will put an iron yoke on your neck until he has destroyed you. Now, notice this curse. Hunger, thirst, nakedness, in need of all things. What's that called? Poverty. Would anybody like to come forward and let me lay my hands on you and pray that God will make you poor? Thank you very much. If I put on stage a brand new Mercedes Benz and a Honda with 200,000 miles on it, 12 years old, leaking oil, and I said, you have one choice, you may have either car you want, they're both fully paid for, choose the one you want. Ain't nobody driving off in that Honda. So would you get over this idea about this poor stuff? I don't know where this comes from. We ought to be the most capitalized people on the face of the earth. And all of the patriarchs were all well capitalized. They were, th- these were envied by the enemy. I want you to do so well and love God so much, everybody envies your success. People outside the church ought to say, holy cow, look at those people. But I want to see the whole nation prosper. God said, I want, to, I want to make you the head, not the tail. I want to make you the envy of nations. So... I hear people say such dumb, well, poverty is a blessing. Blessed are the poor. All right. Then where, where's the revival in the ghetto? How come it's littered with murder, crime, drugs, prostitution, fatherless homes? Why? Because it's poverty. It's a curse. It is not a blessing. And you don't want it in your home or family or neighborhood. You don't want to have anything to do with it. Nowhere in the Bible is it called a beautiful thing to be poor. You can be poor in spirit, and God will fix that and bless you. But broke, that's not even Bible. So picture Jesus on the cross. He's hungry, hasn't had food in 24 hours. He's thirsty. He's naked. He's in need of everything. He's buried in a borrowed tomb. The robe that he has on while he's being uh, marched to the crucifixion is borrowed because Jesus exhausted the poverty curse so we could have his abundance. He made that possible. If you want to live below that benefit, that's your choice. But it's a choice. It isn't the will of God. So God gave up his riches so I could have his wealth. And again, we say wealth. We're not talking about opulent extravagance here. We're talking about abundance. It's going from not enough to barely enough to more than enough so that you can be a blessing to others and honor the Lord with your giving, so that we can bless children who don't have a home and won't have a Christmas 1500 that we're providing presents for out there, all that. That's beautiful, just beautiful, huh? You can't do that broke, and a church can't do very much when it has no funds either. So the church can't prosper if you don't prosper. So I pray for you to prosper righteously and biblically. Number seven. Jesus endured our shame that we might share his glory. It says in Matthew 27, when they crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Jesus was exposed naked to the eyes of everyone that passed by. Only his mother drew near. Now, we have a 20th century modesty and culture, but the Romans were barbarians. And when the Romans crucified you, you were stripped naked, male or female. It did not matter. 
artists put a loincloth on Jesus for modesty, uh, decency. I understand that. But please, may you understand, that didn't happen. He was stripped naked. And so only his mom drew close to him. Out of respect, the others stayed far off from him. And people could walk by and spit on you, could slap you, could curse you. Uh, I think we have these images from artists that these are crosses are 30 feet high. They need oxygen masks to get them. Did you ever figure out how they'd get them up there? No, a crucifixion was probably six inches off the ground, not more than 12 inches off the ground. And they didn't make a pretty cross with hewn lumber. They just cut a tree down. That's why the New Testament always in the original language says a tree. King James says a cross because they made a cross, but it was just raw hewn tree that was cut down and nailed together. And then they put you on that. Everybody understand that? So you, you, you could... You could slap, spit, or curse and mock the criminal that was there. Hebrews 2 verse 10 says, For it became Jesus, by whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. There's a horrible evil spirit of shame. It's a spirit. It comes through adultery, abortion, incest, murder, particularly in children sexually abused. In the United States, one out of four children are sexually abused. But thank God we've got a solution. Jesus endured your shame that you might share his glory. And if you'll watch, some people with a spirit of shame can never pray with their faces up to God. And the problem is quite often shame. That's a terrible thing. God talks about lifting up our hands, lifting up our heads, O ye gates, and rejoice with the Lord. But some people, because of shame, because of guilt that they don't know is forgiven, bow down, keep their head down. That's really shame. That's not humility. They're ashamed. Whether you caused it or whether it was done to you, that shame curse was born by Jesus naked on the cross so you don't have to feel shame anymore. You don't have to apologize for it. You don't have to feel it anymore. It's been nailed to that cross, and you have the right to share his glory while he took your shame. You don't have to walk around a third-rate citizen anymore no matter what happened to you. So the release from every bondage is provided through the cross. Well, number eight, Jesus endured our rejection that we might have his acceptance. Rejection has got to be the deepest wound of the human heart. A person always feels like they're on the outside looking in. And another mark is their inability to express love. So in 1 John 4 verse 19, God says, we love God because he first loved us. It takes the expression of love to release the expression of love. You can't give what you don't have. You can't give what you haven't received. So God says, I'm going to love you first. Now, I expect you Christians to be able to love others, even your enemies. Wow. But you can't do that if you haven't ever received it. And the principal cause of rejection often comes out of a home from parents. An unwanted pregnancy can transfer rejection to that little life in the womb. They will pick up that rejection. More than 50% of children never receive father's warm, expressed love, and they go through life with a wound of rejection. And they suffer with aberrant behavior. They've got a chip on their shoulder. They have anger. They did a survey in federal prisons on Mother's Day and Father's Day. They provide free of charge to the inmates uh, Mother's Day cards. Those were never rejected, but they could not give Father's Day cards out. They didn't want them. We see it with professional athletes, too. The father's not there unless the son becomes a millionaire, and then he shows up. I'm talking the truth. This is a a great clinical psychologist said to me, the first question you ought to ask a troubled person, the first one, tell me about your dad. And boy, it will open the door to real problems. God designed the home so that the father was the one that gave self-worth and identity to a child. With broken homes, fatherless homes, we have corruption, anarchy, and rebellion. We have people who are angry and hostile who try to find their identity through gangs, through illicit behavior. But the whole issue, the root of it is an unworthy, rejected person seeks acceptance from something. That's why we treat everybody the same. You love every race, every tribe, every person that walks in here is a person of value for whom God died. You love them unconditionally. We're not upper class, lower class, white, black, Asian, Hispanic. It's just a people's church. 
all kinds of people, all kinds of different people. We learn to love and honor and respect them because Jesus died for them. In Matthew 27, verse 45, from noon till three in the afternoon, darkness covered the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing by heard that, they thought, he said, Elijah. He's calling on Elijah. He wasn't. They thought so. Immediately, one of them ran and got a sponge, filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a stick, and offered it up to Jesus to drink. He refused it. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he dismissed his spirit. At that very moment, the curtain of the temple was ripped in two from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks split in two. Now, notice something. It said Jesus cried out with a loud voice. He didn't whimper. His strength wasn't ebbing away. He cried out with a loud voice. It is finished. In the Greek, it's paid in full, to tell us stay. It's like if you go to the bank and pay off a mortgage and they stamp it, paid in full. Glory to God. <laughs> thank, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> I can't wait for that for Summit. Paid in full. There's no more hidden charges. There's no more fees. You owe nothing. And Jesus said to the human race, I paid the debt, complete. There's nothing you have to pay. Quit beating yourself. Quit climbing the steps of a monastery. Quit putting ash on your forehead. Quit denying yourself food for a week, unless you feel led to fast. But you don't get any brownie points from me. My son, by one work of cross, one sacrifice at the cross, has forever paid for the iniquity and for your sin of the whole world. There's nothing you need to add to that. Nothing I need, no hoop I need to jump through to earn or merit his favor. It's by grace. It's a beautiful thing. And so what broke Jesus' heart then? The rejection by his father. When Pilate heard he was already dead, he was shocked. It was too soon. And if you read the scriptures there, you'll notice they went and broke the legs of the other two thieves because they weren't dead. And they put them into shock to hurry up the death because Jesus was already dead. But we just read, he dismissed his spirit. They didn't take it. He said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. He wasn't a victim of anybody. He died of a broken heart because of the rejection by his father. And why was Jesus rejected by the father? Because he had been made sin with our sinfulness. And God said he cannot look upon sin. The wages of sin is death. Either you die or some substitute dies for you. In our case, Jesus died as the sinless life. When Jesus gave up his spirit, the temple veil was torn from top to bottom. By the way, the priest sewed it back up. You know what he was saying? When he tore it in two, that the veil that separated unholy men from a holy God was now gone. Now there was open access to God the Father. If you read Hebrews chapter 13, it says, Now we who are believers can come boldly to the throne of God to obtain mercy and grace in time of need. We don't crawl. We come boldly in like kids run into daddies. If your daddy owned AT&T, if your daddy owned the biggest oil company in this city, you wouldn't ask for an appointment from his secretary if you were his kids. You'd run through the office and right by the secretary and say, Daddy, Daddy, I need $20. <laughs> That's what my kids would do or something or say. They wouldn't get an appointment and they wouldn't address me, Oh, thou, my father of, yea, these uh, 12 years, thou who partest thy hair on the left side, yea. <laughs> they say, Daddy, Daddy, intimacy, family, connection. That's why I don't like all this title stuff, you know. Well, Bishop Godwin or Dr. Godwin or Reverend Godwin. How about Rick? Rick works pretty good. Uh, now, if you're young, real young, Brother Rick. That's a, t that's a, that's a term of endearment and respect. You don't, you don't call your, your father by his first name. You might once, but usually your head will go through sheetrock if that happens, <laughs> if you were raised in my family. I, I was taught respect for authority. So to this day, even with my girls, I said, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, because I wanted to instill in them respect for a, a proper authority. You, I'm telling you, don't, you, you if, if authority is illegitimate, you can use authority higher than that authority to seek, to seek justice. But don't, your best bet in, in the midst of an unjust authority is be respectful of it. Even the apostles were when Herod uh, and Pilate uh, was, was slapping Paul on the face when he was being tried. He's a Roman citizen. That's against the law. And Paul railed on him with some nasty words. And 
the man standing by says, how dare you speak to the high priest that rebellious way? And Paul says, oh my goodness, I didn't know he was the high priest, for it is written, thou shalt not speak evil of the ruler of your people. So no matter what authority it is, whether it's in business and sexual harassment, whether it's a policeman, whether it's uh, somebody in, in, in an office, whatever, even a government authority, if they abuse that authority, you have the right to seek higher authority and seek legal means. We have attorneys in here. You do it justice. But if you go through rebellion, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna really suffer loss. So my daddy made me say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, ma'am, to anything that walked that was older than me. I didn't care if the teacher did something. My daddy never sided with me. He always sided with the teacher, even if the teacher was wrong, because he was trying to instill in me, you do not disrespect authority. There is a proper way to deal with illegitimate authority, and we've taught on it, but that's not one of them. So that you, you do it properly, and your life will, will end up in peace and joy and righteousness and, and good things. But it's just good to say, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir. I may have to see you in court. And I will, if it's illegitimate, we'll seek legal means. If you're in here and you're, you're sexually harassed by, uh, uh, once it's rare, but it does happen in every field, politics, the ministry, they've molested children, Pre preachers have done that as well. They should, be, they should be held accountable for that, and you can do it legally. You don't go in with a shot, shotgun and blow somebody away. You take them to court, and you ruin them, you have them in prison, and you get justice for those people. Of course, and I'll be on your side. And we got lots of lawyers in here, and district attorney and others, to seek righteous. But don't try to defend rebellion. Rebellion by God is a sin. God says you submit to the higher authority and those authorities that be of God. So sometimes they're bad, but we can challenge them, and there's a right way to do it. And you can get recourse to do it. So I was just, I was just taught, just practice saying, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. And all of the men in here that are Hispanic, Asian, white, or African-American, I bet you, you go to the home of these military people, I guarantee you those kids will say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, please. Now, you tell me what's bad about that. You come from a broken home and it's, yeah, shut up, I ain't going to do it. Here we go. Anarchy. God loves the home. Satan hates the home. And if he can destroy the home, he can destroy the nation and the culture and a city. God loves a home. Be a man. And I don't know how I got on that. Let's look at these eight exchanges, and then I want to pray. Number one, Jesus was punished for our iniquities that we might be forgiven. If you come to Jesus, you're never going to be judged for your sin again. Two, Jesus was wounded that we might be healed. Three, Jesus was made sin with my sinfulness that I might be made the righteousness of God through his righteousness. I'm, I didn't live a righteous life. I was made legally righteous through the righteousness of another. I didn't do it. It's like your kid inheriting three million from you. He didn't earn it. He, he was born on third base, and he thinks he hit a triple. No, he was just born into your family. Don't let your kids be spoiled, by the way, because you do prosper. You, otherwise, they'll be arrogant, they'll be rebellious, and they, they'll, they'll be a disaster in life. You, you let kids know, you didn't earn this. Get that smart, aleck, snobby, uh, elitist attitude off your shoulders. Uh, your daddy gave you that. You didn't earn it. Uh, I, I was able to buy you a car. Another parent couldn't afford a car. You're not better than that child. You'd be just as bad off as him if, if I didn't have the ability to buy you a car. I really think that's important. I mean, the last thing we need are more snobs. You talk about racism and bigotry and arrogance and elitism. I hope you never get a dime if that's what you're going to become. And then you'll raise kids to be that same snobby, rebellious, arrogant in school. No, sir, you remind them this is a gift of God that I'm able to produce and provide for you and give you nice clothes and a car. <laughs> I, I am so off course here. Where did I stop? Jesus tasted death that we might share his life. Number five, Jesus was made a curse so we could receive blessing. Jesus endured our poverty that we might share his wealth or abundance. Jesus endured our shame that we might share his glory. And Jesus endured our rejection that we might have his acceptance. Eight exchanges through the cross that Jesus gives to you who are believers in Jesus. I want you to bow your head because I want us 
to break curses. And I'm going to lead us in breaking those curses in just a moment because they're illegitimate in the life of a believer, but you still have to resist them. That is, until you address them and rebuke them, they stay killing, stealing, and destroying because they are thieves, and thieves do what is illegitimate. So God's given us authority in His name to bind and to loose. So we're going to do that in just a moment. But first, every one of these benefits that Jesus died for you to have is only for a believer. If you haven't accepted Jesus as Savior or you're not sure, let me take a moment very briefly to include you in a prayer to accept His love, mercy, and forgiveness, and every one of these benefits suddenly becomes yours based on the work of the cross, not what you did. If you're not sure, if you've never accepted Jesus, but you'd like to, you want to make sure, you want those benefits to be yours, could I include you in my prayer very briefly? I won't embarrass you, but just slip a hand up and take it down. Say, Rick, include me in that prayer. My goodness, I see hands around the auditorium. Make sure, make sure. If you're not sure, make sure. I'm going to lead us in a prayer, and I want you to pray out loud with me, and I'm going to ask my church family to pray too so that you can pray with boldness. Say, Lord Jesus, I confess you are the Son of God. I believe you died for me and rose from the dead. Come into my heart this morning and forgive my sin. Give me eternal life. Make me a new creation. Give me a new heart and a new nature. Thank you for a hope and a future. Help me to discover your purpose for my life. And by your grace and power, help me fulfill it in my generation. Thank you my sins are forgiven through your work at the cross, Lord Jesus, and that salvation is a gift that you paid for and that I simply receive. So I thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. And a good amen. One more thing. I want to pray and break these curses. If in your family line, any one of these seven are in the family or your family line or your wife's family line or husband's family line, I want you to, to stand and we're going to break them right now. If you've, you say, well, Rick, I can't identify with anything, then don't worry about it. But I want you to do it now. And I want you to do it until it's gone. My parents, my dad was married like five times and divorced. I didn't want that curse of divorce with Cindy and I. And I remember breaking that curse. I didn't want to put my children through what I went through. And I don't think many of you do too. I'm not going to bear any shame in that. That's under the blood of Jesus. But I'm going to stop that curse right now. You can cut off that bloodline from Adam through Jesus, the last Adam, the new man. And every benefit that's his is yours. So you resist strongly. And until that thing is completely cleared up, you stay on it every day. And you'll be able to do exactly what we do. So I'm going to lead us. It just take about three minutes. So stay with me and pray with me very aggressively. Say, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I break the curse that's come to me through the sins of my ancestors. I am redeemed from the curse through the blood of Jesus Christ. I am the seed of Abraham. And his blessings are mine. I choose blessing instead of curse. Life instead of death. I break every curse from every generation and all iniquities as a result of the sin of all my ancestors for generations past. I break every curse on both sides of my family back 60 generations. I break all curses of witchcraft, sorcery, divination. I break every curse of pride and rebellion. I break every curse of death and destruction. I break every curse of sickness and infirmity through Jesus Christ. I break every curse of poverty, of lack, of debt, in the name of Jesus. I break every curse of rejection. I break every curse of double-mindedness and schizophrenia through Jesus Christ. I break every curse 
of divorce, of separation, alienation, in the name of Jesus. I break every curse of lust and perversion. I break every curse of confusion, mental illness. I break every curse of idolatry. I break and release myself from every curse causing accidents and premature death in the name of Jesus. I break every curse of wandering, of being a vagabond, unrooted, unplanted, disconnected in the name of Jesus. I break every curse that's been spoken against me, every negative word spoken against me by others. I cancel that curse. And for those in authority, I choose to forgive them and I bless them. I break every curse that I have self-inflicted by my own negative words. And I command every demonic power hiding or operating behind every curse to leave my body, to leave my life, to leave my family, to leave my marriage, and to leave my future in the name of Jesus. Whatever I bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. I have been given authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. I submit to God. I resist the devil. He shall flee from me. So I command your power broken over my life and over my family in the triumphant name of Jesus. And everybody shouted amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Jesus. Magnificent Savior. Thank you for the cross. And thank you for what you've done for every one of us. Amen and amen.